to a discussion of new research on resilience to climate shocks in East and Southern Africa. Uh, my name is Sheila Jackson. I'm with the TOPS program. Uh, just a few things before we get started. We are broadcasting this out live via Adobe Connect. So one of the things, if you have a question or comment, please, please, please raise your hand and someone will run over to you with the microphone. If you don't speak on the microphone, people online won't be able to hear you. Also, people online, please, we want to hear your questions. Use the chat box to type in a question, and we'll make sure it gets read out for you. Also, one other thing, please mute your cell phones. Just a little reminder. In fact, yes, mine's muted. Just check mine. Uh, one other thing, all of today's materials, the PowerPoints, any handouts, and the recording that we're making using Adobe Connect will all be posted next week on the FSN Network website. That's fsnnetwork.org, and we will be sending you all an email with the links next week to let you know it has been posted. So now, without further ado, I'm very happy to introduce our moderator for today's event, John Kurtz with Mercy Corps. Thanks, Sheila. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I work with Mercy Corps as the Director of Research and Learning, and coming into this panel today, I was thinking about um, what I've been meaning to do to, to sign the pledge of, to not be on any all white male panels. Um, I'm glad I didn't today, and I feel like we kind of have maybe a, a bit of, a, of an out, like the beards, the facial hair, maybe that's a, kind of an exception in there, all white male with beards is, is okay. Half Japanese. Okay, Brad, thank you. All right, I'm going to take that. No, I, um, I, I would have flouted the rules anyway, because I'm, I'm really excited to be able to uh, to moderate this panel and be able to share a couple of studies that are, um, well, fresh off the press or, or in press in, in some cases uh, around resilience in the horn. Today we, we've missed our third panelist, Mark Constance from Cornell. Uh, so we're actually only going to be focusing on research in, uh, in Ethiopia, not covering Southern Africa today. I want to give a bit of background and then really turn it over to Brad and Tim. So thinking back, we're about five years into I think what most of us consider the, the era of major investments in resilience from USAID, DFID, and others, essentially following the, the drought and famine in, in East Africa in 2010, 2011. And at this point, there's, I think there's two main schools of thought or two main kind of questions outstanding around the resilience agenda. Uh, one is essentially the, the healthy skeptics. And these are people, including me, sometimes wondering, you know, is this delivering? Um, is, is the resilience approach different and better than what we were doing before in terms of rural development, livelihoods, humanitarian response? The other one is uh, more among the sort of the converts, um, and I, I consider myself in that camp sometimes as well. Um, and for those of us that are convinced that this is uh, probably a good thing, we wonder more of how do we do it, right? What do we need to be doing differently uh, than we were before to actually strengthen resilience to, to things like drought and other crises. So these two studies that we're going to share today uh, really hit on those two major questions. Um, and so it's, I think it's a kind of a, a strong leap forward to be able to be at this point where we can say something substantial around those, those, two big, those two big remaining questions. And Brad and Tim's presentations are, are quite complementary in terms of how we're going to look at this, uh, both in terms of the, the populations and the, and the programs studied. So they both focus on uh, Mercy Corps' prime program in Ethiopia, which covers both eastern and southern parts of the country. Um, and they also are quite similar in terms of the, the, the framework and methods that they've used to be able to analyze and understand resilience. I'll let them get into that a little bit more, but I think it makes the findings um, quite compelling as a pair. Uh, at the same time, the studies do look at this from, from two different angles. The research that Brad is going to present on um, is a Mercy Corps study that was much more evaluative, trying to look at that first question of, you know, is this set of interventions uh, under our prime program working to build resilience in the context of, of the most recent drought associated with El Nino? Tim's study, uh, again, under the same population, is much more unpacking, okay, what about the, the population there is, is conducive to resilience or not? So helping us understand you know, inside that black box, what is it that the program may be doing that is most or least conducive to resilience? So again, I think that's it's going to make for a really good package. With that, I'm going to um, 
introduce Brad. Brad Sagar is the research and learning manager at Mercy Corps, heading up a lot of our research on resilience. Uh, prior to that, he was working with Tango, actually, uh, leading a lot of their work um, on evaluations of rural livelihoods and food security programming. So Brad, with that, please come up. In terms of format, just so you can be looking ahead, uh, Brad's going to have a short 15, 20 minute presentation. We're going to take a few clarifying questions in between he and uh, Tim's remarks, and then uh, after that launch into a, a deeper Q&A. So, so please do note down questions that you have for Brad as he's speaking. Great. Thank you, John. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being here today. Uh, really a uh, pleasure to be here presenting some results from our uh, some of our initial efforts in trying to evaluate the impact of resilience programming. And John preempted a few of my points here, so I won't dwell on this too long. But after 2010, 2011, Horn of Africa crisis, there was really a call for better integration between uh, humanitarian and development response. And so this really set the stage for resilience programming and doubling down on those investments. And so when this most recent drought hit, 2015, 2016, uh, we said, this time it's different. We took a position that investment in uh, resilience programming in Ethiopia over the past decade has resulted uh, in, or rather we wanted to explore whether it has resulted in uh, improved well-being outcomes for these populations. So a point I want to make is we're looking at the impact of Prime, but this is really, this represents the latest iteration of resilience programming in Ethiopia. So before that there was the RAIN project, and before that, there was the Pastoralist Livelihoods Initiative. So this is this is really um, those set the uh, the groundwork for this type of resilience programming in Ethiopia. So just a very quick overview of Prime. It's a for those of you who are familiar with it, it is a very large, complex project, um, and we are only looking at a, a subset of interventions within Prime that we think have. Uh, enabled households in these communities uh, to better withstand the impacts of drought in the most uh, recent drought. So these are kind of uh, focusing on livestock production, health, and management. Um, and so things like uh, working on fodder production, rehabilitating water infrastructure, pasture lands for uh, livestock, uh, Im improved access to medicine for livestock, uh, as well as getting uh, weather information into the hands of people when they need it, making plans uh, for what they should do when drought is hitting, um, and also uh, in increasing access to financial services in these areas so people are better able to uh, absorb and respond to the effects of drought. So we really wanted when we were deciding where to focus this study, we really wanted to choose an area that has seen a, uh, a heavy uh, investment of these particular activities over the past three years. So in other words, a place where not only was the programming mature, but also it had to be a place that was particularly affected by this drought. So it's an important point to make here that this is not by any means an impact evaluation of Prime overall. We're looking at a very select uh, subset of waradas targeted by the project, meeting these two criteria of uh, mature programming and heavily shock affected. Another point I'd like to make is that we're not looking at, uh, like John was mentioning before, we're not looking necessarily at the mechanisms, or in other words, uh, how resilience was built or what matters for resilience. We're really trying to evaluate whether the impact, uh, whether we're having the impact we want uh, for the resilience programming in general on select well-being outcomes, okay? So in some levels, we're, we're really looking at high-level well-being outcomes, and that's an important point that I'll be coming back to later. So our estimation strategy, how we're, how we're uh, measuring the impact. Um, this was a post-hoc survey. So in other words, the drought hit, uh, and we said we should, let's see what, uh, what we can find out about the project impact. We did not have the luxury of having a, a baseline for these waradas that's representative at the warada level. Uh, we didn't have the luxury of panel data, and so 
In a lot of ways, we are, we are limited in what we could do methodologically to identify that impact. So what we did was we selected um, uh, cabeles or communities that have been have seen a lot of investment from Prime, and we considered these as, as our treated cabeles. And then we also selected uh, a larger number of cabeles that have not seen any Prime investment. And so these are our control cabeles. Now, you can't compare just treated to comparison cabeles without somehow controlling for the fact that these might be fundamentally different. And so we, we use the uh, match design to try and match our prime cabeles to the uh, non-prime cabeles in such a way that the only difference is whether or not they were targeted by prime. And in terms of livelihoods, agroecological zone, and other community characteristics that matter, they're essentially the same. And very quickly, what we're trying to do is we have prime, whether or not they're targeted by prime as our, our treatment. We control for drought exposure using the standardized precipitation index, and I'll, I'll go into what that is shortly. And then we also control for other household characteristics that we think matter for these well-being outcomes that we're interested in. And I'll go into those, but briefly right now, there we looked at food security, economic status, and livestock health as our main uh, well-being indicators. So this drought, 2015, 2016, was, um, it seems like every year there's a drought. We, we say that this was a really bad drought, and it's a 1 in 50 year drought. Uh, this actually happened to be the case in these particular Cabeles. Um, 2010, 2011 was the big Horn of Africa crisis, um, but when I was digging into the qualitative data, I would see this very common refrain of somehow this drought was different than previous droughts. And specifically, it was, it was different because there was absolutely no rain for a very long period of time. And so that, was, that made it unique. In terms of humanitarian need and how this drought stacks up against previous years, you see here 2016, the number of people that needed food assistance in Somali regional state is about 1.5 million people. And you see 2010, 2011, it's a little, it's like 1.4 million people. So they're actually comparable, at least at the state level. And so I think this is an important distinction to make. Somali regional state is very big, and I think there's a lot of uh, variety in terms of what the, what the need would be. And so what we're trying to do is we want to get this estimate at the Warada or even Cabelli level to understand more whether, uh, whether this was different within these specific communities. This is standardized precipitation index. And I want to take a minute. This is a, this is a, there's a lot in this figure that I want to, but I think it's worth unpacking. So on the horizontal axis, we have years, 2008 to 2016. And on the vertical axis, we have the standardized precipitation index. And what that does is that takes a given uh, amount of time. So in this, in this case, a 12-month period of time. And it compares the amount of precipitation received to the historical record. And using that measure, we can say this year was particularly wet or this year was particularly, particularly dry. This is only for the surveyed Cabeles. So this is only for the, uh, the, both the control and the treatment Cabeles. So this is not state level. This is community level. And what I've done here is I've plotted the bottom of this figure is the minimum, so the, the lowest Cabele. Uh, and then we have the maximum. And this teal green line is the median Cabele within the range. So a few important points emerge here. First, 2010, 2011 was not that bad for these Cabeles. So that's an important point to make that in terms of the, the drought exposure then was not that bad. Second, if you look at previous years, there's not a huge range in variety. They're all within kind of one standard deviation of each other, all of these Cabeles. 2016, though, that goes out, that trend just completely goes out the window. And we see a huge diversity in exposure, with more than half of Cabeles experiencing drought, according to this measure, 
and in fact, uh, a not an insignificant number of Cabela's that are experiencing a one in 50 year drought. So all of this corroborates our qualitative data that says this, this drought was extremely bad relative to previous droughts. So I'm gonna start going into the results and I have to say I'm, I'm a little embarrassed. I actually have more tables than Tim, which I was not, I thought that was a low bar, but <laughs> But bear with me, there are only three, and uh, I'll, I'll try and explain them in a, as, as a general terms as I possibly can. So the first well -being, suite of well-being indicators that we're looking at is food security, and we have three measures of that. The household dietary diversity score, household food insecurity access scale, and household hunger scale. Household hunger scale, as you may know, is actually a, a subset of the HFIAS. Um, but the, these two indicators are experiential indicators of food insecurity. So these are things like relying on less preferred food, uh, going to bed hungry at night, et cetera. So how, what, what is the uh, subjective experience of food insecurity? Whereas household dietary diversity is really just the number of food groups that have been consumed in, in the past 24 hours. So slightly different uh, aspects of food security that we're looking at. And I think what's interesting here is there's no difference in our, our control and treatment groups with regard to the experiential indicators. So in other words, they're using the same coping strategies at similar rates. An important difference though is when you look at household dietary diversity, on average, our prime communities are faring better. They're consuming uh, about 0.7 food groups more than the comparison group, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when we're talking about an average of four to five food groups consumed daily, that's actually a pretty meaningful difference in terms of food access. Our next suite of indicators focuses on economic status, and we have three indicators here. One is the progress out of poverty index, agricultural assets, and household assets. Uh, a quick note on these indicators, uh, progress out of poverty index measures the likelihood that you are under the poverty line in this case, we're using $1.25 a day, and based on uh, an index of about 10 specific indicators that are, or 10 indicators that are specific to Ethiopia, we're able to estimate what that probability is of poverty. The asset indices are actually created using principal components analysis. I'm not gonna go into detail of what that is, but essentially, it's a unitless uh, measure, so it's a little difficult to translate this into monetary terms, but we can say uh, what, are, what is the relative wealth of these two groups. So we see that, in general, uh, prime households are, are slightly less likely to fall uh, under the poverty line by almost four percentage points. Ag assets, initially we saw this, this result and we were curious like why, th this is basically saying that prime uh, households have fewer agricultural assets than non-prime households and they have more household assets. And so we were a little perplexed by this and we went back to the country team and we interrogated this a little bit further and they suggest that this might actually be an artifact of uh, how they're choosing to invest their resources. So agricultural production in this particular region is inherently risky. It's relatively um, infrequently practiced and because it is uh, subject to recurrent drought that you, you assume a lot of risk by growing, uh, by growing crops or choosing to invest in agriculture rather than livestock. And so we think that this could potentially be uh, a result of more informed decision making on the part of prime beneficiaries. Livestock health. So I didn't really appreciate how complex livestock systems are before I undertook this study. I think this is one of the more interesting um, parts of this study and, and per, uh, particularly educating for myself. Um, so we looked at three, these are three very basic indicators that don't capture the whole situation with regards to livestock uh, production and management. But we looked at the number of livestock currently owned, oops, number of livestock currently owned, uh, livestock sales in the last 12 months, and the number of livestock deaths in the last 12 months. And so again, when we saw this result of 
uh, prime, prime beneficiaries generally own less livestock. We were a little surprised by that. But again, this, this might actually be a result of some of the messaging around prime, which is basically saying, let's have, have smaller, better managed, healthier, more resilient herds. So in some ways, this is not, this is not, um, this might not be a bad thing, an inherently bad thing. And in fact, when you look at the composition of these herds, you find that this trend, uh, it continues over the previous 12 months, or rather was uh, consistent over those 12 months. So we think that this is actually um, a fundamental difference between prime and non-prime uh, 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 people. And in fact, they, they tend to invest more in cows and heifers, which uh, as, a, as a pastoralist, you want to have a, a, a large and healthy number of breeding females as a resilient core of your herd. But then we had the question of whether or not we're doing this right. And specifically, we wanted to look at how we were modeling what the impact of this project was. So, as we're transitioning from research on what matters for resilience to research on our resilience programs having the intended effects, we started to realize that initially we were just modeling this assuming that the impact of prime is constant regardless of what the shock severity, or in this case, what the drought severity was. But really, that might not be the case. So this plots livestock deaths and drought severity. And this is using, our, uh, using a model from that emerged out of our data. And what this shows is at lower intensities of drought, the difference between prime and non-prime is, is quite small. And so, for example, investment in livestock health, uh, water, fodder, when it's on normal years, we, we're not going to see much of an, a difference between prime and non-prime. But as the drought increases in intensity and these resources become uh, critical for the health of, of, of livestock, we find that the gap in deaths actually increases. And then as the, as the drought increases in severity and these systems become overwhelmed, we might start to see those treatment effects go back to zero. So as, as the systems we put in place just become completely, uh, completely uh, deteriorated. So that's so a couple concluding thoughts. I think we have encouraging evidence overall on the impact of prime on household well-being generally. I think we still have a lot of questions to answer on what are the mechanisms for how prime is, do, as, is having that impact. And I think that's a, where my presentation and Tim's presentations are really complementary because their, their study is much more uh, focused on the, the pathways and mechanisms to resilience. So we still have a lot to do in terms of uh, understanding better about what's different about resilience programming and whether or not it's working and under, understanding the impact of specific interventions and combinations of those interventions. And I think methodologically, there's at least two takeaways we want to make from this. Take from this. One is this is just one brick in the foundation of, of evidence. We're not quite there yet of being able to understand those mechanisms. So uh, I know it's cliche as a researcher to call for further research, but I think it is really something we need to become uh, better at. We need to, to design these studies more proactively and not just rely on post hoc analysis. Um, and I think it's also important that we understand that the relationship between treatment effect might actually vary with shock intensity and we need to adjust our models accordingly. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tim, or back to John, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you have to, sorry, John, you have to, there is the power button. Thank you. Super. Okay. Brad, that was that was excellent. Uh, this is the first time I've seen this presented as such. So uh, I've got a bunch of questions. I'm going to take a, a one or two quickly. Um, <laughs> take one online, and then uh, maybe one or two from the audience before we give Tim the mic. Uh, my first one was I sort of set up the the question that this was trying to answer as, you know, 
is this type of programming not only distinct, but you know, better than what came before it? Um, and you gave a nice picture of the evolution of, of this type of programming um, in Eastern Ethiopia. But I guess in your mind, and, and <clears throat> understanding the program a bit better, what is different about this that gives it the sort of the, the authority to be a, a resilience program, whereas before maybe we were doing rural livelihoods with, with less of that uh, uh, yeah. approach built in? Yeah, good question. So I think what's what's unique about Prime, and I guess where it builds off of its predecessors, is number one, it's of course multi-year, it's multi-sectoral, it's working across um, uh, different sectors, and I think really importantly, working um, fairly deep within those sectors. So in the livestock sector, they're doing everything on from from production to health management to uh, commercialization and and working on uh, a livestock trade. So it's it's not only is it kind of broad, it's also pretty deep within those particular sectors. It's also building on on uh, flexible funding mechanisms from RAIN and, and uh, the Pastoral Livelihoods Initiative that inc incorporate crisis modifiers into the programming. So they're not just, um, they're, it, it really kind of bridges the gap between emergency response and, and development programming. Perfect, okay, thanks. Abby, you want to give us one from online? Sure, yes. Uh, this is kind of a clarifying question from Tafera. He asks, the severe drought-prone areas in Ethiopia get resilience measures from different programs, such as the Productive Safety Net program. How do you specifically disentangle the contribution of your intervention? That's a great question, um, and I think really that that comes down to how are we uh, matching on these um, on these communities. And so we took a number of different, not only household level indicators that we think are related to these particular outcomes, but also community level indicators um, like infrastructure, um, um, assistance activities, et cetera. So as much as possible, we're able to control for things like that during the matching procedures. So we're trying to isolate as much as possible the, the, the impact of Prime. Thank you for your great presentation. Uh, looking at the graph uh, about the correlation between livestock deaths and extreme drought, mm -hmm. it just kind of brings to mind the thought of these kind of uh, negative tipping points, right? And how can we identify these different social, ecological, economic, and political tipping points in order to kind of target avoidance of those tipping points and also identify sustainable, resilient pathways to kind of transformational resilience, right? So I'm just, it's just kind of triggered that thought and just get your perspective on how we can measure uh, tipping points and different thresholds. Yeah, so I was pretty excited when we, um, I, I'll give the best answer I have to that. I don't know if it's a good answer, but I'll give the best answer I have to that. So when we started thinking in these terms and we started trying, to, trying out these different models, um, I thought it would be pretty neat if A, the models actually fit the data, and in some cases they do, not in every case. Um, so I think that's in and of itself is an important finding that this relationship is not con consistent across all of our outcome indicators. But I think if what would be great is if we do, to, towards identifying those tipping points, is if we start to see that this inflection point here is more or less consistent across different outcome indicators, I think that would be uh, helpful in terms of identifying what do those tipping points look like around, like, is this a one in 50 year drought that, you know, we're good up until, or is this, uh, you know, are we one in three year drought and our systems aren't able to sustain, so. And, and just a quick clarification on the clarification. So in this case, um, it's actually looking at how does the impact of the program on that indicator of livestock deaths change as the drought gets mm -hmm. more severe? So it's not about just you know how frequently do livestock die um, in that case, right? Right. Um, and I and I think it's an important kind of um, piece of piece of information there because we're trying to look at the effect of the program. You could you could equally look at it as a tipping points question. The, no, the worse the drought is, 
the, le the less the gap is between prime and non-prime. In other words, uh, our treatment effect of being a prime beneficiary goes away as the drought really gets bad. So, so it's yeah. basically this big question of, okay, we're investing in prime and similar programs. Up to what magnitude of drought are they going to be useful, right? right. So this, you know, this may be a 25-year drought, but if it's a 50-year drought, you're going to need um, a bigger boat. Yep. And just a quick nod. Um, so this type of analysis was really spurred by some thinking um, from uh, yeah. our colleagues at Causal Design to kind of think about how we model these in ways that go beyond some of the non-linear relationships. Right. Uh, one more from online, and then I think we'll turn it over to, to Tim. Okay. Yeah, so this is okay. from Jamie okay. Montgomery, and she's asking a little bit about the R-squared values. She said, the adjusted R-squared are quite low for both the food security indices and those for livestock health as compared to the other set of indices. If I'm interpreting the statistics correctly, that means your independent variables are explaining less than 10% of the change in those indices. Do you have any thoughts as to what other parameters may be important in this model? That's a really good question. It's something that we, we've certainly discussed, uh, at least at a, at a cursory level. I think we understand that, of course, with this kind of data, we're going to generally get low R-squared values because these kind of social uh, constructs are uh, notoriously noisy for these kinds of this kind of modeling. In terms of what uh, we would have liked to have included otherwise, we, we haven't really gone down that path of identifying additional covariates that we would like to include. Um, but I think that's, I mean, I think that's definitely something we need to consider in the future. Tim, do you have something to say then? No, regarding the, the, the non-treatment voreders, right? Do you know the level of investment in those voreders? Because I believe that there might be many other investment going into those voreders with similar type of interventions as well. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, so, I mean, I, we did ask a community questionnaire where we asked those kinds of questions, I wouldn't necessarily be able to give a dollar amount for the for those cabeles, but that's absolutely something that we did try to control for when we were matching these cabeles, um, because yes, you're right. I mean, these there's a ton of programs in these areas that are working on similar issues. Um, so I, I think that 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 is an issue, but as we tried to control for that as much as possible in our match, matching algorithms. Super. All right, Brad. Many thanks. Thank you. We'll have more chance to dig into it after Tim's presentation. Um, I think it'll shed light on, on some of the, the questions that mm -hmm. were coming up in terms of what else might be in the mix um, besides the program that could contribute to some of these uh, resilience outcomes. So quick introduction with Tim. Uh, he's the president of Tango International um, and has been a, a leading thinker around uh, livelihood resilience uh, since uh, at least the last five years, um, and building on similar work on, on food security and livelihoods prior to that, um, wearing many different hats. Usually he does have a hat on. Um, so right with that, <laughs> Tim, uh, please do share with us uh, what you all have been digging into in Ethiopia yourselves. Okay, so uh, I don't know how many people heard all these other talks that I've given over the last several years, but uh, this is a continuation of, of further analysis of the data that we've been collecting as part of an impact evaluation that we're doing in Ethiopia of the Prime program. Uh, originally, uh, the feedback project was paying for that, but uh, additional analyses has actually been supported by the Center of Resilience from USAID. Um, one of the things that people often don't do when they collect a lot of data like this is they never go back and do a deeper dive into the data that you actually have. Uh, you do a report, it comes out as a baseline, then you do recurrent monitoring report, which we also did. And people often say, well, okay, we've done enough, let's move on to the next one. But what we realize is that there's a lot of rich data in, in these data sets that could be explored much further. And um, what we wanted to do was basically determine, one, are there positive deviants? In other words, households that actually were able to maintain their food security over time in the face of these double, there were two rounds of droughts in 2014, 2015. Um, what was different about those households? Uh, what kinds of strategies were they implementing that was different? 
than people that weren't positive deviants. So that's one of the things we were very much interested in investigating. And two, could we really determine, um, are there certain kinds of capacities, resilience capacities, that are uh, likely to lead to better recovery? And also, it's kind of an echo, so it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> better recovery and also um, one of the th one of the things that we're always looking for as researchers is we're in search of the holy grail okay and what I mean by the holy grail is this we're looking for resilience capacities that we could invest in that not only enable households and communities to recover quickly but also do not lead them to turning to negative coping strategies and lead them to do more positive strategies okay possible task can we ever even do that because if we can identify those kinds of, 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 of capacities then those kinds of investments are likely to lead to much stronger resilience and less likely to lead to households turning to these negative strategies that we know have long-term ne negative consequences things like pulling your kids out of school uh, to go work what you're doing is you're hurting your future human capital in that regard uh, cutting down on the foods you were eating and your consumption, which has an effect on your health, um, getting into debt with money lenders so that you that debt can last for years and years afterwards, so it can be very difficult to recover. So these are the kinds of negative coping strategies we don't want to see happen. So how can we make investments that actually don't lead to those kinds of decisions? So that's what this research is all about. We're, we're going to do a deep dive into our work. So just to give you some context, even though the 2016 uh, drought that Brad was talking about really hit the, the Somali region of Ethiopia hard during the El Nino event, 2014-15 wasn't so good either. Now, the Jajiga area that we were working in as part of this impact evaluation, wasn't it hit as hard back in 2014-15 as it was during 2016, but Verana, which is to the south, um, was hit really hard during this time. So if we look at where we're actually collecting data as part of this impact evaluation, we have the Somali region up here in the north and then the Verana region in the south. And this Verana area was actually hit by two waves of drought. It was hit uh, first by a failure of the first, they have two rainy seasons, so the first rains failed and then the second rains failed. So even if households were resilient or communities were resilient to be able to manage the first drought, they had problems managing that second one. So we had, a, unfortunately, we had a great opportunity to understand how households and communities actually manage these shocks uh, over time. And so one way that we were able to do this is we have what we call a recurrent monitoring system or um, where we, we wait till a shock hits and then we actually track households over uh, every month for six months to see how they are actually are managing those shocks. Okay, so we have a baseline which has a lot of information on each of these households, but then we have a panel data set that we're actually tracking. So it's, we have 412 households that we're tracking over time to see how they're doing managing these shocks. Okay, so it gives us great opportunity to understand the dynamics how things unfold over time, or if you will, the pathways that people actually are going through to actually manage these shocks. So there were three research questions that we were trying to test with the data. One is which resilience capacities enabled households to recover from the drought? The second one is what were the coping strategies that these capacities either enabled or helped prevent? In other words, if it's a negative coping strategy, you want to prevent that. If it's a positive one, you want to support that. And then which resilience capacities should be bolstered to increase households' resilience to drought in the prime project operational area? So taking all of this information into account, which ones should you be investing in that will actually bring about a bigger impact on their ability to recover? So we use three types of methods to try to look at this. We use growth regressions approach, where we look at the change of food security over each drought wave and that's regressed on a variety of indicators and household community resilience capacity while controlling for the degree of the shock exposure, the initial food security, and household characteristics. Okay, now 
what's important is we also use the same kind of drought measures that Brad was talking about before, you know, tracking uh, these uh, SBI indicators, but uh, several others as well, as well as trying to understand households' own perceptions of how they were dealing with these shocks. We also have a positive deviant analysis. So we identify those households that fared much better than average over the course of the drought waves. In other words, their food security did not get worse or even got better over those two drought waves. And so we want to know why, did, why is that? What, what happened there? And then finally, we are using these descriptive and regression analysis to determine which capacities enabled or prevented these different household coping strategies. So we, we pulled out each of these different uh, coping strategies and look how they matched up to these different capacities. Okay, so there's a bunch of tables that go with this and I, I promise if you really want to look at those tables I'll share those with you, um, but I didn't want to bore you with, with all of those because they are very detailed. But I just want to give you what the results were. And what we found across all the analyses, the capacity that was most consistently associated with households' ability to recover from drought, which had the strongest evidence that exists from our analysis, is access to financial resources. So it was, it was very, very strong in terms of enabling people to recover. But there were other things too. So we found that there were other capacities that showed up of having support households' ability to recover from shock waves, and these were bonding social capital. In other words, if those of you who've listened to me in the past, I've talked about three types of social capital. I talk about bonding, which is the connections between people within communities, um, what we call bridging social capital, where you have connections to people that live in other communities where that you can draw on that are not exposed to the same kind of risk environment. And then what we call linking social capital. That's where you are connected to somebody in power or uh, the government or an NGO that actually can pull resources in that you need to, to respond. So access to formal, informal safety nets was also important. Availability of hazard insurance, ac asset ownership, and access to communal natural resources. Now, what's interesting about some of these things is that they're the same kind of things that Prime has been trying to invest in. I'll come back to that. Okay, so one of the things that was kind of Disconcerting, but in the end, I don't think it's disconcerting, and I'm going to say why. When we looked at the coping strategies used by positive deviants that allowed them to be able to maintain their food security, it had a lot to do with participating in food for work or cash for work and receiving food aid. So these formal social protection mechanisms that were put in place, these process modifiers that, that uh, Brad was referring to, really made a difference in terms of people, especially over time, they really made a difference in enabling people to actually um, maintain their food security, but also allowing them not to turn to these negative coping strategies. So having access to these transfers is not a bad thing. In other words, we always kind of give lip service that both emergency and development interventions have to be part of our resilience approach. Well, this shows you that it really is part of it good social protection that's timely, long enough, in the right amount, will make a huge difference in protecting people. It doesn't mean we shouldn't still be doing development activities to try to prevent people from having to depend on food aid or depend on cash transfers, but it, it also recognizes that if the severity of the drought is so great, as your loop shows, you're going to basically need to have some way of protecting those assets, protecting people's livelihoods, so they can get back on their feet. But we didn't stop there. We were interested in knowing what are the things that really make a difference in allowing people to manage these shocks and stresses better. So the PRIME project, if you look at the goals and objectives of the PRIME project, it really is focused on enabling households to become more resilient to future droughts in a self-reliant manner. You know, they're trying to identify those resilience capacities that are associated with less reliance on food aid during the drought. And would, they would like to discourage the use of these negative coping strategies that undermine households' long-term resilience. So we talked about tipping points a, a, a few minutes ago. Um, one big tipping point, if you remember from my last presentation, I, I know not all of you heard me talk, but my last presentation, I really emphasized the importance of 
when clan leaders actually start to leave the villages, the amount of redistribution of resources that happens through these informal safety nets that are in these uh, communities actually start to break down. And that is a huge tipping point for deciding how when vulnerability is going up dramatically in these villages. When the clan leaders leave with their animals, there's nobody else that kind of makes sure that every, all the poor and the elderly and, the, and women and kids get some kind of help. So that's when, you know, if you were looking for when do you need to make sure that social protection kicks in hard, that's when that tipping point is. So what we found, though, is that there are a set of capacities. When you run all these analyses that we've just done, that reduce people's reliance on food aid, that encourage the use of positive self-reliant coping strategies, and reduce the use of negative coping strategies, these eight capacities show up as really important. The bonding social capital, access to informal safety nets, people's asset ownership, bridging social capital, access to financial resources, investment in human capital, that includes both education as well as health, access to communal natural resources, and social protection in these communities. Now, for me, that's almost, that was unbelievable when we actually came up with these results because we never thought we'd ever be able to find something that says, you know, here's something that actually reduces people's time of recovery or allows them to manage the shock and stress okay without having to turn anything negative, without having to rely on formal safety nets that enables them to actually manage these shocks and stresses. And so these kinds of, of capacities and these kinds of investments will make a huge difference um, and should be really looked at as part of the prime program, particularly if the next phase is designed around this. So what do we want to say in conclusion here? First, that life-saving assistance, such as food aid and assistance in, and cash transfers, in the event of this livestock lock, loss, even hazard insurance, will continue to be needed in the future if the severity of the drought is so big. And I think that, you know, unfortunately, uh, Somal the Somali region of Ethiopia and Burana in Ethiopia are going to continue to get hammered by these kind of weather events. So we need to be cognizant of that that this timely social protection can prevent households from engaging in negative coping strategies and contribute to their recovery as demonstrated by the positive deviant analysis. These are critical investments. This social protection is a critical investment as part of any of our re resilience programming. And then finally, the investments should continue to build on those resilience capacities that enable households to become more resilient to future droughts and in a more self-reliant manner. So if we can figure out how do we build bonding and bridging social capital better? How do we actually improve people's access to financial resources, both credit and savings? How do we make sure that communal uh, access to natural resources is something that we can actually enable households to have access to in a sustained manner? All of these things that came up in these eight capacities, I think, are going to be critical for going forward in, in Ethiopia. I'm done. Thanks, Tim. That was record time for Tim. I mean, that, that's huge. That's, no, really, really insightful stuff. Um, we're going to do about 10 minutes of, of grilling Tim just on clarifying questions. Uh, I'll, I'll take the first, and we'll open it up. And then after that, let's, let's shift into more across the two presentations, you know, what are, what are big takeaways or outstanding questions that we have. Um, to start, I think one that I have, and maybe this caught other people, but you, you call out financial resources as um, somehow not just important, but sort of um, at, at a level above some, some of the other factors that you were able to identify. I guess first, what do you, what do you mean by financial resources? Is that savings or is it financial services? So, so help us understand what, how you were defining that. And then and why, why is that, you know, Given what, such, what? such a call out compared to the other factors. Um, well, I think when you think about people's access to savings, it's a way for them to to manage these shocks and stresses in the in the short term. So it helps them absorb these shocks and stresses. But access to credit allows them to diversify their income sources in a number of different ways. So they can actually diversify 
into strategies that are less exposed to those risk environments. So what's, what's interesting about this is that we've been doing uh, this kind of analysis not only for Ethiopia, but we've done it now in West Africa as, as well as um, in other places. And we've found that this is a consistent finding, that this access to financial services makes a huge difference in people's ability to, to manage shock and stresses. Thank you. Um, Tim, great presentation. And my question kind of follows on um, John. Um, USAID REAP funded project is implemented in the East and West Harare areas. Um, the CRS is the prime on that. And what's interesting, during the El Nino period, um, we found that um, shocks and stressors, of course, affect women and men differently. Mm -hmm. But just to follow on on that question, um, we found that women in Ethiopia tend to be greater participants in savings and loans. And my question to you is, um, did you look more closely at that? And secondly, we also found that during El Nino, the fact that women did have access to savings and loans, albeit not huge sums of money, but that made a significant difference in the household of these vulnerable households, whether they could sort of cope with the impact of El Nino, and more importantly, their status within the household increased. Because in some cases, they were using the savings or credit to start small businesses like petty trade. Um, so I think also I just wondered if there's any additional thoughts or research around that question of shocks and stressors, men and women, um, access to credit, and savings and how you see it in terms of additional research. Okay. Um, that's, that's, that's great. We, we, uh, we're very interested in, in looking at the savings issue in much more detail. We, we're going to be doing uh, an end line as part of our impact evaluation next year. And so, um, and we just also have just done a re another round of the recurrent monitoring which we haven't started to analyze yet, so we'll be able to look at some of these issues a little bit more closely. Um, but I, I do think that it, we should try to disaggregate the impact of those between men and women as part of our impact evaluation mm -hmm. on the end line. So we're going to try to do that. But, but I, one of the things I want to say is savings groups are really, what, what we've found in other studies is that savings groups really are a way to build social capital in these communities. And the savings groups often take on other functions, not just part of savings. So once, once these women are used to working with each other, we have found in other studies in Ethiopia that they actually start to engage in other kinds of collective action together, um, where they will be more involved in trying to manage natural resources together. They'll be more involved in trying to um, provide informal safety nets to each other. Um, so one of the things we often don't do is, as in NGO programming is we tend to look at whether the, you know, our evaluation of the savings group, is it working, is it still continuing, how much money is being saved, how much. So we really kind of focus in on the savings group rather than the multiple functions that this group might actually engage in in addition to just savings. And so if we really believe some of our findings that social capital is really a, a huge driver for resilience, then we need to understand how these groups take on these other functions as well. And, and that needs to be part of our monitoring system, which often isn't there. So, oh. <laughs> uh, that was a very deft pivot, if you guys didn't notice. He's basically saying, no, we didn't do gender analysis, but and these other really interesting findings that you might be, you know, curious of. Uh, but I think it's harder than it, it sounds based on the data that, that yeah. I know that you all have. Uh, so it's, it's, it's one worth pushing. Abby, is there something from online? We have uh, Hannah Estefanos asks, what was the full list of resilience capacities that were studied in this project? Are there capacities that did not help households avoid negative mm -hmm. coping strategies? Or were the results inconclusive? Yeah, there, there's a very large list of these. There's like 22 capacities. Um, now, one of the issues that all researchers face is if, you're, if your N is too small, some things that might actually show up as important 
may, maybe just barely didn't make it. And so what we're hoping that, that this gives us insight when we actually do the end line, which is going to be a much bigger sample, a much bigger panel sample, um, we'll be able to tease that out much more effectively. So let me give you an example. I think that uh, aspirations is something that we've always been saying is an important thing. Uh, you know, people's psychosocial uh, characteristics, how people feel if whether they're in control or not, does that make a difference in how they actually manage shocks and stresses? We think that that is really important, but it didn't show up as strong as it should have in the analysis. But we think that with the end being a little bit bigger, it will show, show up as important. So, uh, you know, it was it was at it wasn't at point oh five; it was at one. So it was almost there, but it didn't make it. So, uh, so we think that in the next round, we should be able to see some of the stuff that's a little bit. And so, the other these other kinds of capacities are contributing. On the positive deviance analysis, um, not as familiar with that methodology. Hoping you could explain a little bit more on on how we interpret th those results um, with, without an experiment. Is there is there a concern and and maybe there, there are controls in the model for just pulling out um, heterogeneous effects there? And and if you see these results that people that were involved in the in the cash for work or food for work programs, could that just be demographics driving that? Uh, people that already have higher social capital and access to those programs, young healthy males. Uh, people with you know, different levels of, sure. of human capital. Sure. We, we actually tried to control for those factors. Um, I can give you the, the more detailed analysis on that. It's kind of complicated, but we actually were looking at, we were matching up peers to positive deviance, looking, holding for all these characteristics, and then these were the differences that showed up. So, but again, you know, the ends are kind of small, um, so that's always going to be a problem. Uh, but the Positive deviance were about 20, 24, 25 percent of the of the population that we were looking at, and these had to be people that actually um, either maintained their food security or got better over time, and so that's how we basically decided who who would be in that group. Just so I guess a related quick question: um, you, you both spoke about relying on formal safety nets in the form of you know food aid or, or food for work as a contributing factor to being a positive deviant, or I can't remember the outcome, um, as well as it being an outcome of some of these other factors. You're saying it, it, those factors help people rely less on food aid. So just trying to understand how you use that same indicator on both sides of that relationship. Okay, so the thing about the positive deviance is they may not have had the, at, at the beginning, at the baseline, they may not have been food secure, they might have been a little bit lower on the food security scale, but they had to show that they actually got better over time. And so um, some of those households that are already food secure, um, that weren't relying on, on the, the food aid, these other capacities are what really made a difference for them to be able to uh, stay away from it. Yes, so Sarah King asked, regarding access to communal natural resources, did the research point to which resources in particular were important? We were looking at grazing land, um, but also people's access to woodlands and uh, water, and all three were important. So. Uh, Mayor Russell with CARE. Um, so I was wondering, actually I have two questions, I'm sorry, but um, one question is to what extent, and either of you could answer this question, to what extent was um, access to information about likely um, El Nino effects and the potential impacts, to what extent did that make a difference in terms of people's coping capacity because Gideon, you reference the whole informed decision making, so people knowing how to make decisions at the time. And then um, Tim, in terms of what you're looking at and some of these key factors, um, looking at when things get really bad at that, you know, when say people can cope with, you know, maybe a 
25 year drought, but not a 50 year drought. To what extent can what we've learned about that be used in terms of adaptive management? So if we know those conditions are coming down the pike and it's likely to be in that realm, how, you know, how often do we need to monitor? What things do we need to monitor? And can that be done in such a way that our operations can change accordingly? You want to take the first shot? Yeah. So just to quickly answer your first question. Um, so we didn't necessarily look at what was the impact. The design of our study wasn't focused on um, what specifically about the prime project had an impact on uh, household resilience. So we're not necessarily looking at whether access to information uh, imp uh, was somehow related to improved food security outcomes. That's just not how we, we set up our study. But I will say that when we started to look into like what kind of intermediate outcomes are um, related to prime and that we see among the prime households and access to livestock and livestock market information did emerge as one of those um, uh, big outcomes that is different between our treatment and comparison group. I think that um, access to information is does show up in a number of our other studies as something that's really important for helping people manage these shocks and stresses. Um, and in fact, in this more recent work that we just did, access to information uh, also led people to, to take advantage of crisis modifiers more. Okay, so that I think that's important, that they knew where to go and how to get the resource. The thing that I also want to say, I think Mercy Corps and, and CARE, because CARE is part of this project, um, they are learning over time how to make the crisis modifiers more effective. You know, I think that at the beginning, when they were first putting the price, crisis modifier together, there were a lot of bureaucra bureaucratic hurdles that were preventing them because they had to go out for bid for all these fodder producers, and that took a long time. And by the time they got access to the fodder, it was too late. You know, so it didn't really have much of an impact. Um, they they figured out how to do that more quickly, and so I think they the crisis modifier has become more responsive and more timely and uh, and that's making a difference in terms of being able to help people not have to turn to these negative coping strategies. Yes, so this could be for either of you or both of you. Uh, this is from Sh Shaktikur from CARE Bangladesh. So what is the difference or relationship between resilience and sustainability? <laughs> um, I think that what's really important about the concept of resilience is that it's a means to an end. Okay, and so if you have a very um, shock-prone environment that you're in with lots of um, you know, a lot of shocks and stressors that are affecting people. You really can achieve sustainability if you don't actually program for those shocks and stresses. Now, sustainability also has to do with uh, sustained delivery of services and um, being able to have the institutional mechanisms in place to, to actually deliver those services, which may not have anything to do with, um, well, they're affected by shocks and stresses, but they may not if you don't have those in place, even though you've figured out ways to manage shock stresses, you still it's going to be difficult to sustain long-term development without that. So we, we believe that there is a connection between these two things, particularly when um, you're trying to promote what we call transformative capacity. That's the enabling conditions that have to be in place that allow for you know the right policies to be in place, the right uh, services to be delivered, the right um, uh, changes in norms that allow for equitable distribution of resources and decision making those ha take a long time to change and but if you don't if you don't bring about those kinds of changes then people's adaptive and absorptive capacities will never be able to work effectively you know, particularly when the when the shocks are too big 
So they're related to each other, they're important to each other, but they're not a substitute for each other. Okay, I'd like to shift slightly from the details of the studies um, to where is this taking us? Um, and I have a question for both of you that is a bit around, um, okay, both of these studies uh, took advantage of, of, of a particular type of shock, a drought in a particular place, uh, eastern and southern Ethiopia. Um, what can we take from these that we may be able to transfer or even generalize across both you know, populations and geographies? So beyond these places within Ethiopia, do, do any of the findings potentially shed insights on what we should be doing elsewhere? Um, and then thinking about different types of shocks. Uh, you know, the drought is important in the horn, but there are other things going on that people are facing. Um, to what extent do we feel like or could we say that any of these uh, findings would uh, transfer into resilience to floods or market shocks. So I want to, want to push you both on that uh, to start. Brad, you want to, you want to take a first crack? Sure. Yep, thank you, John. Um, so in terms of generalizability, I always am pretty cautious about that. Um, but I will say that this does seem uh, the, the communities that we were looking at were obviously very drought prone. This is something that happens regularly. So I think that that's absolutely, we can, we can think about that in terms of looking at other areas affected by drought and, and seeing similar types of investments. Um, I, I, I think that there's some value there. Can we say that um, the impact will be exactly the same? I, of course not, I don't think so. Um, in terms of looking at different shocks, I personally think that that's, um, I, it's, I have a hard time saying that building resilience to drought is the same as building resilience to flooding or, or other um, types of shocks like, or conflict, things like that. I think they're, they're fundamentally different, and I think that it's what's required is we do start to look more uh, at these other, um, uh, other types of shocks. I'm sure that we will find some consistencies like bonding social capital or linking social capital is, is important no matter what type of shock or what type of context. Um, there will be uh, kind of universal things that are universal truths, but I, I, I don't think we should assume that by any means. Well, we've already started to do some meta-analysis uh, on some of these uh, capacities across locations. and. We're starting to see some similar patterns showing up with regards to the importance of social capital, uh, the importance of uh, access to financial resources or services. Um, we're starting to see even, even aspirations, how important those are across locations with regards to uh, how that affects people's ability to manage shocks and stresses. So I think more meta-analysis, the more that we do this in more locations, we'll start seeing some commonalities across locations. And so, um, but I, I do caution us to, to jump to conclusions that it's these three investments that we should be focused on worldwide because context drives everything. And it's really important to uh, do a good contextual analysis of where you're working to determine where your leverage points are going to be. So, you know, I think at the same time that we're getting better at understanding these capacities, we need to get better at doing a better contextual analysis as well. And I think that some of the work that Mercy Corps has been doing on this stress approach that they've been emphasizing allows us to do some of that kind of contextual analysis. I'd just like to add very quickly to what Tim said, because I think it's an important point of, even if we do start to see social capital financial resources uh, emerging as important across contexts, how we work on that across context is also going to vary significantly as well. And I think that's kind of our, the, our jobs in terms of the research frontier of thinking about not only what capacities are important, but how we're building those capacities in, in different contexts for different shocks. Right. I mean, I think that is a good example. I think Tim's example of working with the, uh, how you know, you might have external effects of different groups that that might it may or may not be a consistent across contexts. Um, it, it could be stickier somewhere else or less sticky. Um, so, I mean, I, I can't think of a specific example. Tim, do you have any beyond that? I, 
I'll, maybe I can throw it to the group because just let's just think about financial services. So broadly, we're saying these are important, um, but do we need to be working on those in different ways in a general sort of stable development mm -hmm. context um, to have success versus you know what needs to be unique or different about financial services to support resilience to droughts? Is it do people have thoughts or insights on that? I actually, I can add quickly, and this is not droughts. Um, this is, you know, coming from the Nepal earthquake resilience study. We found that financial services were important for recovery, but importantly, uh, formal financial services fell apart in the aftermath of the earthquake because um, those systems weren't resilient to the shock. And so informal financial services really emerged as an important, um, uh, was, was associated with quicker recovery. And so I think that's I think that's a good uh, indicator of how it, that can differ by shock. Thanks. Um, just some of the work we've been doing in northern Uganda, which is sort of drought focused amongst other shocks, um, showed to us, which seemed obvious afterwards. But if you're the on in um, contrast to what Brad was saying, when we're relying on informal financial services, they tend to be everybody in that financial service area is exposed to the same risk pool. Mm -hmm. So they might be useful as a way of saving and potentially investing, but they all get hit by exactly the same drought at exactly the same time. Mm -hmm. So there's not, you don't get the benefit of risk sharing that you might do with formal systems. Hi, Corel Arendt uh, with USAID Center for Resilience. Uh, my question is, it, as a follow-on perhaps to yours, I was curious as to um, how much uh, thought or work had been also done with regards to government um, or building the role of government mm -hmm. in these programs. And I recognize that your programs, the programs are you know, NGO focused and maybe at the community level more so than central or department or Wereda level, well, still at Wereda level, but in general, do you uh, think that you can um, also talk a little bit about the role of government in um, building resilience? And specifically with regards to, you mentioned informal safety nets um, versus formal safety nets. Um, Carol, you're going to knock your coffee off? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that. Uh, one of the problems that we have in measurement on governance, mm -hmm. not, not just government, but governance, is that um, we're still working on those metrics. Now, we have looked at governance, not in this context per se, but in, in, Ethi sorry, in, in Bangladesh. And uh, so we, we took the Shahardo project and we reanalyzed it using a resilience lens. And what we found was, CARE had already developed a pretty good measure of governance as part of that project. And we found that governance really did make a big difference in, in terms of, of having a positive effect on people's ability to manage shocks and stresses. So I think the more that we can develop these kind of measures and, and include these in these studies that we're doing, the better we'll have a handle on that. But government is going to play an important role as part of any um, you know, the kind of basic services that are being provided to these communities and um, the formal safety nets are going to be critical to that. Um, but not just the formal uh, safety nets, but also access to health care, access to education, all of those things that help build human capital that uh, also support resilience in, in the long term. So, you know, I think government has to be factored in on this. We just have to get better at the kind of metrics we use to to see what their effect is. Yeah, so we have a question from online from Garrett Shishe. And so we've been talking about kind of individual capacities. And he wants to know if you know if certain combinations of the identified capacities lead to more resilience. And how does the intensity or depth of a certain capacity influence changes in resilience? And what implications that has for designing future interventions? How come I get all the hard questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one of the things that we, we always try to do in, in, this, in these analyses is we do create indices 
uh, around these capacities. So we have absorptive capacity, which are an indice on that combines uh, capacities that we think enable households and communities to absorb a shock better. We have indices around adaptive capacities, which we think are ways that are proactive in a sense that households and communities are making proactive decisions about how they're going to manage a shock and stress because the change is here for good and they need to do something different because they can't continue to do the same thing. That's where a lot of your climate smart agriculture, changing of livelihood activities, that's where that comes in. And then transformative capacities, which I've already talked about, which are these combinations of kind of enabling conditions that have to be in place, the infrastructure, the, the institutions, the, the policies, the, the governance. So we do try to look at the combinations of these things and their effect, but for programming purposes, you have to pull them apart to really um, see like, okay, absorptive capacity, for example, in, in, in Bangladesh, we found that absorptive capacity really made a difference in people's ability to manage floods. Okay, so uh, that's important to know because, you know, disaster risk reduction as part of your absorptive capacity probably makes a lot of sense. If you've got a flood that's a quick onset disaster, it's about to happen. Uh, whereas a drought, which is a little bit slower as it kind of unleashes, gives you a little bit more time to think about what other kinds of things can you, strategies can you use to deal with that. So we, we think you have to do both. We think that you, one of the advantages of having these capacities kind of pulled together is it, it'll, it essentially allows different sectors to see where they fit in the resilience uh, agenda. You know, it's not just a DRR activity or it's not just a climate change activity, but everybody sees where they fit. Um, and how they can support resilience through their own sector interventions. And it's the integration of that that makes a difference. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, hopefully I'm not overstepping my boundaries as a non presenter <laughs> but um, I think it's a I think the the combinations of capacities is a really excellent question um, just analytically when we analyze these whether they're in an index or as different components in a regression you know if it's the latter you're holding the other constant which is not reality and if you're looking at it in an index it's kind of they're all very your your assumption is that they're varying in similar ways or ways that logically make sense what happens in a household, though, is that you may have a household that's high on access to information, low on access to financial services because of certain different types of barriers, and high on social capital, or vice versa. And so there's another analysis that I've been trying to get someone to run, um, which is called a cluster analysis. And it kind of applies the logic of a factor analysis, but to your independent variables where you're allowing the, the uh, certain types of profiles to emerge from the data that happen to reoccur over and over and over again. So different types or profiles of households will emerge such that you can, I think that would allow for um, quite effective adaptive management, in fact. So if you notice that certain households that are high in social capital also tend to, or that there are two types of households that tend to be high in social capital, those that have access to financial services and those that don't, right? Then you're able to kind of jigger your programming in a way that speaks to those different realities on the ground. So just making a plug for maybe some, maybe we can have a learning event on cluster analysis. It doesn't seem like it's as used in the econometric space as maybe some other disciplines, but it is very effective at identifying uh, profiles of whatever, profiles of students, profiles of, in this case, it would be households, um, to help direct how to respond to those different types of profiles. Excellent, thanks. Other questions? I've got one last one. Uh, since you took the, um, since you took advantage of being able to in interject from the floor, I'll throw a question that could include you as a respondent. Um, so we've got a lot of rich 
data, really interesting results. We think that there are some, some serious implications of these on how we go about doing resilience uh, in these geographies. How are we helping to translate that into actual decisions? You, Tim, you talked about Prime 2. That's obviously a, you know, a clear audience um, or set of users for these results um, and, and Mercy Corps, potentially other you know, audiences. I guess, what are you all doing? Uh, we can speak from Mercy Corps side. Um, from USAID side, we'd be really keen to hear you know, how we're getting this into the hands of the right people in the right ways. You want to take a shot at that? We can, we can tag team at me. Um, so we're, you know, Tim, Tim kind of opened this presentation talking about the importance of deep dives. And so from at least the Center for Resilience perspective, we're, you know, in a great and fortunate position to have such a robust m and &E, particularly on the E side, the evaluation side, where we've been afforded the opportunities to really investigate some key questions around our resilience investments. We had certain questions going in and we thought you know, these particular questions would make the most sense. Anyone who's done research knows that that evolves over time, and yet our mechanisms um, often don't allow for adaptability on the evaluation side, right? You answer the questions that you had in the beginning, it's only those questions, and then, you know, kind of project over onto the next report um, or next data collection. What we've really pushed for is kind of taking a step back um, looking at the initial findings that emerge at baseline, at interim data points, and saying, this generates a ton of additional questions. Are we able to inform any of those with the data that we already have, not collecting new data? And to the degree that we are able to answer some of those, um, how do we feed this back into programming in the most timely manner? We have certain questions, but obviously partners on the ground, our mission staff, also have different types of questions that would be generated from the same findings. And so we've tried to partner with them to identify key questions that emerge from, from any given kind of standard analysis to do a deep dive such as um, the one that Tim presented here in order to uh, inform programming. And we're actually hosting a workshop along with um, some TOPS consortium members, Mercy Corps and um, Tango, to work with partners to socialize this idea that um, the, the work isn't over after you get the evaluation report, aka don't let that report rot on a shelf somewhere, <laughs> that there is so much more that can be done and so much programming to inform um, with the data that you've already made quite a strong investment in um, from the evaluation purposes. So I don't know if you want to, okay. Is that answering question? Okay. Um, yeah, I just, uh, we noted at the beginning that Mark Consis from mm -hmm. Cornell University couldn't be um, in attendance today because of some flight problems. Um, however, he um, would have uh, talked to the collaboration with Catholic Relief Services Malawi um, on a project uh, we call MIRA, uh, Measurement Indicators for Resilience Analysis. I'm certainly no surrogate to talk in to the level of detail and research that went on. However, in kind of response to how to use it for programming, um, our CRS Malawi program is implementing a, a Title II USAID funded develop, development program. And as many of you are well aware, um, the impact of the weather phenomenon El Nino has been um, as devastating or causing as much food insecurity and distress in Southern Africa where there's probably about 30 million food insecure households. Um, but what Cornell, working with our CRS Malawi program did, was try to look at both um, the individual idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasy, <laughs> very hard word for me to say, um, but which is also important, right, because right. health often comes up as an issue if you lose the um, breadwinner of a family. And then also at the more widespread shocks like um, El Nino or drought, and um, what's really interesting is our programming really wanted to better understand real-time targeting. Um, and so we're using some of the results of this to help, uh, you know, looking at the surge capacity or other food assistance that USAID could provide within the context of, of the um, situation there. Uh, the development program itself is reaching about 250,000 households, but there's you know, expected need of another 100,000 plus 
for food assistance. And then finally, um, the other, you know, to be additional research to this Cornell University CRS Malawi collaboration is how do you get communities to be more interested in undertaking this information data gathering on their own to better understand, you know, how, um, you know, the early warning, so to speak, of these shocks and stressors and how better at a community household uh, or even, in, you know, at the local government level they can use this. Um, so that that's part of it. But one of the other interesting things about research, as we all know, um, communities, especially those prone to shocks, um, you know, you, you have to be sensitive to their workloads. Uh, we have been with Cornell and, and CRS Malawi uh, undertaking household monthly household panel uh, research. And one thing we don't know as we continue out, um, and I'd be curious if anybody has any um, comments on this, you know, how do you try to assure that you don't have attrition among those households because, you know, here they see the enumerators coming again to ask questions. <laughs> Um, and when, when they suddenly um, uh, refuse to open the door or to respond to it, um, how do you continue to get that good, rich data to continue to better understand resilience and the appropriate, um, you know, programming um, steps? And, and uh, just to add, CRS Malawi does not offer any incentives um, in order to ensure that there's uh, no, you know, misunderstanding among community members about this. So I, I open that up as um, a question to, to hear from any USAID or uh, Brad or Tim or others. Yeah, um, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because we actually faced the same problem from the first round of the recurrent monitoring we were doing. Unfortunately, the Somalis also have guns, so when they see you coming uh, and they don't want to be interviewed, they make it known. <laughs> So we decided to uh, not do it every month, but to spread it out over two months. Um, and for a couple of reasons. One was uh, we wanted to capture information over a whole year because during whatever decisions you make in this season have an effect on what you can, decisions you can make in the later seasons. And so capturing that for a whole year seemed to make sense. And doing it every two months is not such a burden on them. So they, 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 they don't really get upset. So we found that they'll actually talk to us a lot easier if you just come back every two months instead of every month. So that's that's how we adjusted to that. Um, the other the other thing you can do is um, you can alternate um, kind of uh, where the real burden comes is in the qualitative stuff. So if you have a focus group every month, that, that's what gets really old for folks. So you can, what we found too is that you can do a focus group and then a key informant interview, focus group, key informant interview. That way you're, you're also spreading that burden out across, uh, across different people over time. But I, I do think it's, it, it gives you such great insight to, to collect this data over, over time that we need to kind of strike a balance between not making it a burden on the people we're asking the questions to, but also trying to understand how they're managing these shock and stresses over time. So, yeah. I just want to add one or two points to that because I am also glad that you brought that up because it's very extractive and I think there's some big ethical implications post shock that we really need to uh, get serious about discussing. And if we are, um, if we agree that we should, that A, of course, this research is important and provides valuable insights and is has a long term benefit for all of us. Um, and that we're also not going to begin providing incentives for this, I think we need to consider other means of creating shared value with the communities themselves and somehow um, sharing this data with them and, and, and providing this, uh, you know, using, using these insights and feeding it directly back into the communities. Whether or not that's something that they uh, might value, I, I, I don't know, but I think it's certainly more effort than we've made thus far. And I think it, this has always been an issue for me, and I think it's getting worse once we're starting to go on a bi-monthly or monthly basis. I mean, one other, just one other thing to say about that. We, we try very hard uh, in the questionnaire that we used that it's really short. It's 15, 20 minutes max. Not one of those two-hour questionnaires that you tend to see happen on these baselines and end lines. But, so we try to reduce the burden as much as we can on the houses that we're asking. 
Yeah, so we have another question from online from Tefera. Uh, so resilience interventions target severe drought prone areas. However, studies also suggest that moderate drought prone areas are facing elevated risk of undernutrition and child mortality. Do you have any plan to assess this situation for further policy or program recommendations? Uh, I'll take a very quick first stab at that. And I mean, I, I can't speak to anything uh, in the very near future uh, towards that, but I will say that so far, um, a lot of our research has been very opportunistic and focused on the really big shocks. Um, and I do think that there is definitely something to be said for those more moderate shocks. I also think that we haven't done as much on idiosyncratic shocks as well that I think Colette alluded to with death of household members and other things that are affecting you know, smaller numbers of people, but that they have huge impact on, on household wel welfare. So yeah, I don't think I really answered your question, but I mean, it's from a research perspective, we really focused on the big shocks just because there might be better measures of them. Um, and there, we have a larger number of people affected, which you know, gives us a larger pool to sample from. Yeah. I, there's been studies that have basically pointed out that um, these extensive shocks, what they call the small ones that are affecting people, uh, are much much greater in terms of their effect on the people around the world than these big uh, covariant shocks. And I think one of the things that really launched this, this whole resilience movement was that 2011 drought in, in, in Africa and then the 2012 in West Africa. So I think uh, we've trying, to, we've, we've been focusing on those areas first, but I think that there hopefully can be lessons drawn from some of our research that can be applied in these other places as well. All right. I, I feel like, um, we put these guys on the spot for a good bit. So I'm going to let them out of the seat and um, just give some concluding thoughts. Um, before I do, I want to make sure I, I don't forget to thank TOPS for organizing all this, including all the online work, uh, not easy, as well as FHI for hosting. So w what I'm seeing here is um, something quite encouraging because you know we're, we're starting to match some of these really big investments in resilience that are, let's say, well intended, but at least to date, not super well informed. Um, we're going on kind of gut instincts. Um, we're starting to match those with um, some really strong research and evaluation. And we're starting to get uh, answers. They may be fleeting, but they're, you know, we're starting to see some things that are emerging that, you know, isn't just, well, this appears to be, you know, an important factor. Um, so, I mean, to me, as a, as a research, that's just encouraging. I'm hoping people that are doing program design uh, starts to feel like there are actually some real touch points to gravitate to, towards around resilience that aren't just um, best case guesses. Um, where I see us still uh, needing to go, I guess, a, a couple of detailed questions that I think are unanswered, and then one bigger one. Um, the first question is, is really, I think it's prompted by this one online, which is, Great to see these things rising to the top in terms of you know, what factors are important, what people are relying on. Um, I, I'm still a big advocate of looking for those ones that don't make that cut, right? Can, you know, can we start saying, you know, maybe you know, maybe linking social capital is important, but as far as we're seeing in these contexts, not something that's going to you know get you resilience dividends in a drought. Um, I think if we could start parsing those out more instead of just expecting that they might become significant when we have a bigger sample. Um, at least going at it with that mindset, um, I think would be helpful. The other one is what we talked about around, fine, something is important, something is helpful, something is working, but what makes that something different uh, in a resilience lens or approach than it was when we were just doing it in natural resource management, uh, livelihood nutrition programming um, for decades before? Um, and I think that the research is starting to get at that, but I think it's another layer that we're, we're probably not poking at quite uh, enough at least through these studies. Um, and the last one, you know, this may be wishful thinking, but um, I still feel like within this topic, we're still talking about um, isolated factors, right? Um, and it's not even the combinations, which is, I think, really important to understand, although hard to do. 
but I, f I feel like we're not necessarily talking in terms of um, moving towards some theories yet, right? The, most of the point of research like this is to try to sort of um, ground truth a theory or develop a theory that helps us say, all right, when we're working on with these populations on these issues, there are certain things we know about human behavior and how the world works that we could apply as a sort of a first guess. Um, and so I'd, I'd, I guess I'd like to see us try to move towards, you know, housing some of these findings and others that are similar into, not an a overall theory of resilience, God forbid, um, but, but theories um, that help connect some of these different capacities and outcomes together. Because uh, I do think that that would help us to learn more collectively as opposed to these sort of looking at isolated pieces of the puzzle. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Really want to thank Tim and Brad as well, uh, and all of you all for coming out as well as folks online. So appreciate it, and we'll follow up. Okay, and just real quickly, I uh, just wanted to uh, give you a couple of closing remarks. Once again, also not only thank John for moderating, it's not just Tim and, you know, uh, Tim and Brad, so thank you, John. Um, also, definitely want to thank the TOPS planning team. There's a lot going on here. So Julia, Abby, Mia, and Holly, thank you for everything you've done running the microphones, running Adobe Connect, getting everybody registered. Thank you very much for that. It's been a smooth event. Also, uh, just in case you don't know, TOPS has started a resilience task force. Tim is the chair. Mia is the manager. Um, they'll be having their next meeting sometime in November. So if you're interested, those of you in the room, please give your card to Mia. Those of you online, if you go to the FSN Network website, fsnnetwork.org, by the way, that's the best website ever, um, you can sign up for a newsletter or just go to the Resilience Task Force page for more information. And uh, just also as a reminder, all the materials, the PowerPoints, also the Adobe recording that we did will be put on the FSN Network website uh, within a week, and we will be sending you all an email with that information so you can watch it again or just have this information. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Uh, both of you online and in the room, we really appreciate it. Thank you.